This is the horror movie show on HMPod.com, your one-stop shop for all things horrific and horror-related. Read the reviews, frolic in the forum, hem and haw over the horror scopes, and listen mightily to the horror movie show with Mark and Jerry, your horrible hosts. Howdy, folks. Jerry here. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Mark. Oh, it's Mark. Hey, Mark. What are you doing here? I don't know. I just kind of, yeah, I just came into the room and you were sitting there next to the mic. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's my, and the funny thing is that I carry this mic around with me all the time. Really? Yeah. 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 It comes in handy in some instances. Luckily there there was something to plug it into because normally I just trail the cord behind me. (laughs) And do interviews on the street with nobody. (laughs) Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. So, you know, I keep myself busy <laughs> so um happy new year we've uh, we got uh, a bunch of new movies to talk about this week and one uh, golden oldie let's start off by uh, talking about ender's game recently in the theaters i don't know if it still is but it's a good looking movie but ultimately pretty darn silly i thought you think yeah i did i, did. I don't know I another don't know kids what the... movie another kids movie yeah this one i can consider more kids and Hunger Games. Right, right. And well, I know how much you love that. Game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, H- Hunger Games, I think, it started as a kid's story, and it, it tried to elevate itself. Although I still think having, you know, such a young protagonist and, and young characters and so on. And I guess I'm talking more about the first Hunger Games movie. That was very definitely, I thought, aimed at the same crowd that, that like, that One Direction band you know it's uh-huh. the same audience but ender games is an old it's an old story it, it oh, was yeah, written ba- based on a book by orson scott card who is a uh, well well-known science fiction writer yes he's in trouble these days with his anti-gay comments oh is he i have no idea yeah there are was... some of his short stories that's about all i know they say that there was some sort of fan revolt uh, when these when uh, this movie was coming out because of some of the things he said about gays. So oh, okay, he's an ignorant dumbass. So you know, I don't know. So Ender's <laughs> Game, 2013 movie written and directed by Gavin Hood, based on the book by Card, stars Asa Butterfield. What a mellifluous name. <laughs> As Ender Wigan, our main character, Harrison Ford, looking very craggly as Colonel Graff. I think it's a typo. It should be Colonel Gruff. Um, <laughs> he doesn't look like a dog. <laughs> yeah, he sounds gruff, though. Haley Steinfeld as Petra Arcanian. Look at these movies, just like The Hunger Games. They give them these fancy sort of Harlequin romance names. Uh-huh. I, th- I think to try to give them some depth, but I'm not sure it works. Well, maybe it's just future. Uh, yeah, the, the names future. are going to be different. Yeah, uh, those really. are the movie stars of the future. Abigail Breslin, you might remember her as the uh, charming little girl in um, Little Miss Sunshine. She plays the sister of Ender, Valentine Wigan. And Ben Kingsley, uh, also a guy with a with a funny name in this movie, <laughs> Mazer Rackham. Oh, I thought you meant Kingsley. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I, I can live with Kingsley. Ben is kind of ridiculous. So this movie takes place in the future. The idea is that Earth was attacked by the Formex, who are a gigantic insectoid sort of race. For some reason, they're extremely technologically advanced, and they build Why? giant ant spaceships to come to Earth. And the reason, supposedly, is they wanted our water. Yes. Okay, fine. What are they going to do with it? They're going to pack it up and take it home? Yep. Like how, exact- much, how much can you carry? You yeah, know? That's exactly what they were going to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So- You'd need an awfully big ship to transport the Pacific Ocean across the stars. <laughs> But they do a little at a time. Yeah. yeah one mouthful. <laughs> like an ant. Like an ant. One big drop between their big pincers. They would do it for a long, long, long yeah. time. Yeah. I can't get over how insects are so smart and they can do yeah. space travel. Right, right. And human- but, of, but, of course, they're not smart. The queen is smart. If you uh, kill yes. the queen, all the rest of them go, oh, boy, <laughs> and they all die. <laughs> they're, all their planes crash, everything like that. So, 
Oh my goodness. This is a nothing more than a variation on Starship Troopers. Yes. Even fighting insectoid like creatures. Except for Starship Troopers was so much better. Oh, much more entertaining. Yeah. Much, much sillier and much more uh it took itself a lot less serious. But you had a great director in Paul Voorhees. Yeah. You know? So right there is a big difference. I don't know who the hell Gavin Hood is, but uh, as director of Ender's Game, that should not be at the top of his resume. <laughs> you know, and yet he'll probably get six or seven more movies because this is like Harry Potter. It's a I can see this being an unending series of movies aimed at uh, at adolescents. Bug lives. <laughs> hey, well, adolescents. A Cer- bug's life. That's certainly, it. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bugger's life. The uh, the ending is is not just set up for a sequel, but is basically starting the sequel. Yeah. At the end. That's true. Yeah. That's very true. Of course, it's a long series of books, so right. there's a lot to be told, obviously. Right. right. Well, it doesn't have to be I told. <laughs> I, I haven't read the books. No, neither have I. So I was kind of enjoying the storyline. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, nothing earth-shattering, but at the same time, I enjoyed the the movie as a did whole. You? Yeah. yeah, I did. Mm. It wasn't so obnoxious that I thought, "Oh, this is a kids' movie." I'll tell you what's thing. obnoxious: that little Ender there, who's like this super genius at military strategy, yeah, and, and able to command loyalty from the kids who hate him and come around to see that yes, he is in fact better than they are. The fact that he throws little hissy fits constantly acting like the child that, in fact, he is, but is not supposed to be. And he's just like, he's constantly pouting and stamping his little feet and, oh, quit, oh, I didn't quit. Th- I didn't think it was such a hissy thing as him. It's his way of rebelling, but at the same time, he had a point to everything he did. It wasn't uh, just I never, just I, a complaint. I thought he came across as a real whiny little toad. I did. Yeah. He I didn't was a like little him bit a little bit of a smart ass. Yeah. Well, smart ass is all right, but I didn't find him likable and I think that as the hero of the movie, he ought to be likable. Admirable. The fact he's he's got a good brain doesn't alone make him a likable kid. I didn't take that away from that. I found that he had obstacles in his way, Mm -hmm. and that because he wasn't the big, tough jock that a lot of these other guys are, he had to work on his strength, which was his brain, his intelligence. So he had to achieve what he wanted to achieve in different ways than a a normal jock would. So to be a leader, and he wasn't convinced he was going to be a leader. Well, until halfway through the movie. Yeah, he was told that he had the capabilities (coughs) of being a leader, but I felt that he really had to grow into the part to believe in himself. Mm -hmm. That's what I liked about the movie. I thought there was an increase in his arrogance, but not an increase in his maturity, which would which would be necessary to be a good leader. I saw no growth. Well, I thought he, he he understood the people that he had to convince to follow him. He had a big dilemma on that. He didn't think that there would be any followers. He couldn't envision people following him at the beginning. Right. As he overcame his disadvantages, one thing after another, he became more confident in himself. And plus, everybody around him became more confident that there was more ways of getting things done than Mm. the brute force way of normal cadets and things like that. I thought the whole relationship (laughs) with him and his sister and him and the Harrison Ford character... Harrison Ford, he's trying to create something out of Ender Mm -hmm. that Ender doesn't see, yet Harrison Ford sees it. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to get him to be the person that he wants to be. And it's interesting. I mean, we don't want to give away the ending of the story the way it it unfolds, but it's like it's leading up to bigger, bigger, bigger confrontations to the point where the problem with the way that Ender was approaching is is that if he didn't succeed this time, he could always do it the next time. It's like a reset on the game. Right. And that's where the whole... Because it's all simulations. It's all simulations, and (coughs) all these tactical things that he's doing is supposed to lead up to this big battle that he's going to be in. Which will eventually, at some amorphous time, 
in the future. It will save fight. save yeah, humankind. Right. People react differently under pressure, and if there is no pressure of dying, if you can just hit a reset button, you are going to do different things right. differently and take more chances because you don't feel like you're going to die. Right. So right. I thought the whole idea of no loss scenario really right. is not realistic right. in the way of teaching people. Well, yeah, but I mean, military games have been going on like that for millennia. And I think that, yeah, actually that's true. It just occurred to me that generals in the war room aren't really at a life-threatening, and so they'll send uh, hundreds of legions off to get killed because they'll sweat off their their brow because they're not going to die. That's that's how World War I was fought. Because if you put the generals in the front line, they're going to think differently about war. Indeed. Well, yeah, okay. I think you're giving it way more credit than it deserves. What did you think of Harrison Ford, though? What a um, slurring his words. I couldn't tell whether he had a stroke or was drunk. <laughs> I'm not used to seeing him in the, in these kind of roles, right? Yeah. You're used to seeing him as a smart-ass, you know... Action man. Action guy. Yeah. And it, He just sort of stomps around in the background going, Oh, we found a good kid here. Oh, he's a good kid. Oh, I believe in Ender. Oh, he's a good boy. Yeah, yeah. He's ruthless as well. Yeah, 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 and he's a liar. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> whatever he has to do to win, he's going to do it. It's a weird movie. It, it is. And it, it looks good. It looks good. Yeah. Uh, so you know, there's a there's always that. I've seen every one of the Star Wars movies, most of them on the big screen, and I would don't regret going to see them on the big screen because they're beautiful movies. That doesn't mean that I needed to see Jar Jar Binks on the big screen or that I enjoyed seeing Jar Jar Binks at all. But, you know, I was glad to see that race scene on the big screen, even if it was just an ad for a video game. Yeah, that's you know, true. all that sort of stuff. <laughs> can't beat that very first Star Wars movie. You, just, you can't beat the very first uh, Indiana Jones movie, because they were new. They, they seemed fresh. You know? Right, and, and in effect, they weren't new. They were just being rehashed. They were rehashed, yeah. From, uh, from the 50s. But, and... they, were, but they, were, they had a new sensibility, you know, the story type. The serial sort of stories were certainly old from the 30s and 40s, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that uh, kids that, that we were in the 70s didn't enjoy the first Star Wars movie. Oh, hell no. That, that Never was... seen anything quite like that. Exactly. Yeah. It was completely off the wall. Which... Yeah, yeah. It, you it didn't. It, and, so. and the fact that they had humor <coughs> in it. Yeah. That was the important yeah, thing. Yeah, if it didn't have humor, it wouldn't have been as successful. All those hop and, and, and you can pick were... it apart all you want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can pick apart all the Star Wars movies, in fact, but they still make billions of dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's not a, not a good way of determining whether something's a success or not. I like the second one the best, actually, of the Star Wars movies, The Empire Strikes Back. Be- because Harrison Ford is finally quiet at the end of that. <laughs> No, it's just that it takes you onto different worlds, mm-hmm. and they really expanded on the special effects to the point where you know it was it was like you really were going into different worlds. Mm. I enjoyed that. Okay. Well, if it doesn't have an Ewok in it, it's crap. Bullshit. <laughs> That's right. they. They are the things. Jar Jar Binks and Ewoks are at par with me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay, so uh, our next movie is another 2013 movie, The Monkey's Paw, a venerable story, a novella, in fact, by W.W. W. Jacobs. goes way back. I remember my dad reading that to myself and my uh, little buddies when I was having a sleepover when I was about eight years old. Is it actually based on the novel? A novella, yeah, a long short story. And uh, so uh, he, they actually bring someone back to, from the dead. Well, right, I'll give you a real quick pricey of the original novella. It's an old couple, and they get a hold. I don't remember how, but they get a hold of the monkey's paw, and they they're told they have three wishes. So they have a son, and he's away. He's a miner. He works underground in the mines, and their very first wish is for money, I think. And suddenly there's a knock at their front door and they open the front door and it's a very sad hat in hand representative of the mine who says, I hate to tell you, there was an accident at the mine. Your son is dead. Here's a check. <laughs> okay. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Right? And then, I, then the second wish, I wish our son was back. Uh-huh. And shortly thereafter, middle of the night, whatever, there's a sort of wet, slushy sound, (laughs) 
outside the door. It's the it's the mum who makes the second wish that the son was back. She's so heartbroken. And there's like a thing outside their door sort of scraping with its bloody wet raw <laughs> flesh. Let me in, let me in. And the father at the very last second, because the mum is going to let whatever it is in, mm. he wishes it away and the noise stops and it's gone. But just a terrifying story. Oh. It's wonderfully okay. done. Okay. So, now this movie, 2013 version, directed by Brett Simmons, written by um, Mason Blair, stars C.J. Thomason as Jake Tilton. He's the main character. Stephen Lang as his psychotic buddy, Tony Cobb. Michelle Pierce as Olivia. Corbin Blue as Catfish. And the only name actor, Charles S. Dutton, as Detective Margulis. In this movie, young Jake, you know, he's, he's friends with this hideous guy, Tony Cobb. And mm-hmm. Tony really is like a knife-wielding lunatic. He's, he's a, an old-timer. Yeah. He's a, like the scrap. Yeah. You would think that he would have been in a Hell's Angel. Yeah, at he's, one a, he's point. a real mean-spirited son of a bitch. And they're working at, at a factory yeah. of some sort. And he's a forklift Do, driver. Doesn't, doesn't he have a son? And his son has recently died. And he's Tony is even more off the rails because because of the dead son. Uh, no, it, no, he's just recently got a divorce. Oh, okay. And his wife won't let him see his, his son. Won't let him see his son. Okay, it's been yeah. a while. It's a month and a half since I saw this. So Jake is given this monkey's paw. It's sort of thrust at him because you never get happy from owning this damn wishing. One wishing of the guys paw. at the at the factory, yeah. his dad actually used the right. paw, and it drove his dad insane. Yes. And yeah. he was given the monkey <coughs> paw by his dad, and has never used and, it, and never used it because right. his dad said, "Be careful yeah. with what you yeah. wish yeah. for." Yeah. He just got fired from the factory. Right. And he's kind of pissed off with Jake. Yeah. So he, he gives it to him. He, they, they meet up at a bar accidentally. Right. And he's got this monkey paw. I guess he was considering using it. Yeah, maybe. Now that he he's right. at the end of his sort of life and his job, he had no, he's no prospects. Yeah. So he was sitting there with the monkey paw on the table. When Jake shows up to apologize right. for getting him fired. Right, right. Instead of using it, gives it to Jake. Right. Right. And says, this will grant you wishes. Yeah. I don't need it anymore. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> you little bastard. And Jake <laughs> says, the first thing he says is, I want that Trans Am sitting in the parking lot. Yeah. That's a mint car. Yeah, I want to yeah. own that thing. And the keys are in it, and it's unlocked, and it's just waiting for him to take. take. Which he does, and I thought, it's a big leap to suddenly assume that, yeah, I got my wish granted, and it's mine. Yeah, well, It his, is a his, bar in a town, you know, it could belong to somebody else. Well, his friend... <laughs> what's Tony. His, Tony oh. basically gets him to take the car. Yeah, he says, yeah. "Look, it. Tony, your wish came true. Yeah, Tony's let's a take real the bad car. influence. Yeah, let's yeah. take that car for yeah. a ride." And they go off on a ride. Right. And they end up smashing the car. Yeah. yeah. And Tony is thrown through the windshield yes, he's and onto dead. the ground, and he's presumably dead. He's very dead. Yeah. Anyway. Good old Jake is he's he's upset. Yeah, he's upset. Sure. Oh my God, my best friend just died. Yeah. Oh but my! His best friend who threatened him with a knife just a little while before. Yeah. I mean, in life, Tony Cobb was a raging lunatic, and I got the idea that Jake is only friends with him because if he stopped hanging around, Tony would hunt him down and kill him. So Jake is scared of Tony more than anything else. Now, Jake doesn't purposely make that wish. He's over his dead body, and he's shaking the body. Wake up, wake up. I wish you were alive. Yeah, yeah. Well. Oops. Oops. (laughs) (laughs) So now you got a zombie, essentially. He's walking, he's talking, but he's also extremely murderous. Well, Tony Cobb yeah. wants Jake to make his last wish that he can see his son right, again. Right. And Jake doesn't want to make that wish no. because he can only see bad things oh, yeah. coming from this wish. So he is reluctant <coughs> to make this wish. Mm-hmm. And Tony is going to make him yeah. make this yeah. wish because why, he can't do why it. Why Jake doesn't just wish Tony into the middle of the ocean, I don't understand. Because then all of a sudden the ocean comes to them. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. An asteroid would hit the earth at that second and everybody would drown. Yeah. 
It's, yeah, that's just the way the monkey paw works. It's it's like making a deal with the devil. You 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 ask the devil for a million dollars, and he kills your family and says, "Here's an insurance check." Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. So it was really well done. I like the movie. Yeah, it, it's a very little movie, obviously very low budget, but it's effective and it it barrels right along. Because Tony goes off the deep end, mm-hmm. trying to force Jake to mm-hmm. do this, so he's torturing all of Jake's friends. Yeah, and yeah. killing them. Yeah, until he makes this wish. Yeah. And there's a cop, the the Dutton character, Detective Margolis, is is on the hunt. Yeah. But, uh, of course, any time where the supernatural is involved, the police are are always going to be a big step behind what's actually happening. Yeah. Yeah. So I kept thinking about the Simpsons monkey paw. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. uh, The monkey paw is just such a good... It is. Advice. Yeah. It's just a good tool. Well, it's a great old, great old story. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know the same sort of character that because there's been other versions of the monkey's paw, and if you if you look at the more traditional ones that stick closer to the flavor of, of the original story, it's sort of along the lines of of a shop like in Gremlins, you know, with a, yeah, with yeah. a mysterious old Asian yeah. man. Yeah. Don't do this. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> beware. Beware. <laughs> Anyway, well worth seeing. Our next movie is uh, an oldie from uh, way back in 1981. Yes, there were people in 1981. <laughs> this was uh, still post Star Wars. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's a movie called Possession, written and directed by Andre Zolovsky. Stars Sam Neill, the beautiful French actress Isabel Adjani, Heinz uh, Bennett. And uh, Michael Hogben as Sam and Isabel's son, Bob, which I think is a funny name for a kid. Every time they refer to Bob, I think, who's Bob? Oh, wait, it's the kid. I, I was sort of, wouldn't you call a kid Robbie or Bobby? You or know? something, yeah. Bob, Bob. It just seems an odd, oh, yeah. truncated name for a little boy. Yeah. This is, it's, as Mark mentioned in an email to me, well, I can't quote it exactly because it, it used a naughty word, but this is one peculiar feature, isn't it? Yeah. This is this is about not one I think this this is a movie along the lines of say Roman Polanski's Repulsion, in which somebody is descend or or taxi driver for that matter, it's somebody descending into madness. In this case, it's two people descending into madness. It is the weirdest movie. A husband I've- and wife. Yeah, Sam Neill looks so young. He's so skinny. I've and, never seen him so skinny before. He's Australian, isn't he? Is. he? Yeah, yeah, but he sounds European. He, he sounds odd. Yeah, yeah, he sounds yeah. very European. I think he wants to be sort of and this is, transnational. It, it, this is a European movie. It is, yes. And the scenes, <laughs> the scenes between all the different actors yeah, in yeah. this movie are so... When, when Isabel Jenny has that breakdown, oh, that yeah. fit... All by yourself yeah. in that subway tunnel. Yeah. And it's like a five-minute scene of her screaming mm. and writhing. And, and it is as raw as anything I have ever seen on film. I, that was the kicker for it's me. It's just <laughs> wild, isn't and it? Then, and then, oh, man. And just the way that the scenes are shot and acted. They're so odd. The way they're acting, mm-hmm. the way they're relating to one another. Oh, man. It's like something like like you'd expect a couple of people going crazy in a mental institution. Yeah. You know, oh, they, they've skipped their meds the last couple of days and they're, they're breaking down again. They are both absolutely in- crackers. Yeah. I don't envy actors that go into a, a production like that right, because right. they probably have no idea what the director's going for. It's, it's a wild ride. It is wild. And the fact that the wife has got a lover, Heinz and... Heinz. Was it Heinz? Oh, Heinrich. I'm sorry. Heinrich. Heinrich something. Like that. Heinz Bennett is the actor. He plays Heinrich. Yeah. Yeah. And he is this suave, debonair kind of guy. That German guy, but he's he's odd his own self. Yeah, he's I mean, a little he's bit odd as well. Every, everybody's yeah, odd yeah, in this yeah. movie. Yeah. And the fact that she <laughs> has got this demon of some sort yeah. that it is <laughs> animating her. <laughs> what yeah. what can I say about this demon that is raping her? And yeah. all, oh, yeah. I don't know if it's rape or it's what. A, it's a monster of some kind that she keeps in her bedroom. Yeah. And of course, and all this is symbolic. You know, it's is it her sexuality that is driving men crazy? But men come and they look in her bedroom and they see this thing. And yeah. the next thing you know, she's bashing their brains out and feeding, feeding them it to her. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh my God! It's like I didn't know what the heck to well, make of that. You know, very Cronenberg. Very subtle in that it's in the dark. Yeah, it, it's yeah. not clear. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you really have to look to see yeah. the the, but, the form but, of the and, figure. And, and you know, Cronenberg was making movies not dissimilar to this at the time. You know, I'm thinking Videodrome. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and so if I was forced to compare it to something, I guess I am. I would compare it to Cronenberg. Yeah, but. To me, as you say, it's the acting is so much further than anything Cronenberg. Cronenberg it, it absolutely underplayed yeah. <laughs> everything compared to this This movie. is all overplayed. Oh, super overplayed. Oh. Yeah. I just kept thinking, what is this? Mm-hmm. What is this? What what has Jerry got me I, looking I at now? I found you a good one. <laughs> and then, especially at the beginning, it's all about two lovers splitting up and her going off and him going nuts and her going nuts. And then, then you find out she's living at this place. Yeah. And then you find out there's some kind of creature. Some monster. Some yeah, monster yeah, in yeah, this yeah. place. And, well, then, and, and you could argue that it's all in his mind or all in her mind. Of course you could. But, but it taken sort of literally by the end, I'm pretty sure that it's two people going crazy, and there may actually be a monster. Yes, because he <laughs> he sends Heinrich yeah. off to her place, yeah. so that she'll kill him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. <laughs> it's it, like it is. It is most peculiar. Oh, now there's two versions of this. There's a longer version, an uncensored version which is supposed to be easier to understand. I don't know which version we watched. It may have been the from version what, what edited I recall, from recall, I think I saw the director's cut. Okay, that's good. That would be the full version. Yeah, yeah regardless. I, it, I understood it, is, it fairly well, you know, I, as, as I, well as I think anybody could understand it. I just kept saying, what the hell? Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. Especially the conversations <laughs> they were having, and then the, the way they were acting out the scenes, and the mm. whole thing with the, her lover... The German guy, and then finding out that she's got this this whole floor of this yeah. place, and there is something living in that yeah. room, yeah, yeah. and that she's killing people. I'm going, oh my god! Yeah, it's yeah. just ah, it just was the weirdest <laughs> movie. All right, I think I broke Mark's brain. Oh man, I mean, that's, I, a, that's another one that I think I saw some people talking about it on one of the horror pages on Facebook, and I just thought, oh yeah, that sounds like fun. Why not? We should be educating ourselves on some of the older, well-thought-of movies. And Possession, again, is it a horror movie? Well, you know, it's a horror movie the way Cronenberg's Naked Lunch is a horror movie. Yeah. I mean, it's full of metaphors and symbolism and nonsense, and it's supposed to shock. But at the same time, strictly speaking... Is it a horror movie? You know, it's it's weirder oh, it's than a horror. horror movie. Oh, she's feeding it to those demons. <laughs> they're they're getting killed. Yeah, and and that demon yeah. is pulsating. There's, there's and, something bad going on so, in that room. Yeah. It's a hell of a movie, though. It, it has a wild, wild ride. So I, I we would, didn't we didn't even talk about her son and her relationship with her son and yeah. his relationship. Oh, and, and the, the, with this teacher. Yeah, I was going to say, what what about the teacher looks exactly the, like his wife? Different colored hair and she's like the polar opposite emotionally yeah whereas a Jani, as the wife is a hysterical lunatic the teacher is as sweet as pie but if you noticed totally non-sexual like yeah. I, I think she does sleep with sam at one point just to sort of tie them together but she's without seeming cold because she's nice all the time but she sort of picks his hand up and takes it off her whereas isabel when she's the mad wife is very sexual yeah and, you know oh yeah oh i mean she's all over sam they, yeah yeah you know, that's a love hate thing the, the fact that they're they, breaking they, up they, only they, makes her hornier yeah <laughs> and you know they beat on each other yeah, they, and yeah. then they, and they make love but it's they like, threaten each other with knives and stuff but you know that just is foreplay yeah <laughs> it is really good uh, good disturbing is more my take on that good it and disturbing so, Oh, I don't know. It's not a feel-good movie, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, if you want some a disturbing movie, this is one to see. Yeah, one Fa- of the fascinating movie though. I I, oh, I did enjoy it. I I just didn't know where you got this one. From, <laughs> ah! from hell. Uh, I, I, after I finished that, I was drained. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. So was Sam Neill. Well, I, uh, I just, I just couldn't believe it was, it was him for one thing. He yeah. was so young. Yeah, I've never I, never seen him look so skinny. I thought I saw him in one of his first movies, which was the one with Nicole Kidman, Dead Calm. 
Right. But he's much thicker in that, even though he's fit. Yeah. You see him with his shirt off, but he, like, worked out. His shoulders are broad. In this movie, he literally looks like a skinny kid. Yeah. And now, of course, he's like a big Australian drinker, you know? I don't know if he's so much bloated as just older. Well, yeah, he's in his 60s now. No, I'm just perhaps cruelly describing the way he looks to me now, because he's not a young man anymore, but... In this, yeah, he's a young, handsome guy, but with a wild, rolling eyes. <laughs> <laughs> they all had a wild, rolling eye. Oh, it's it's a movie of crazy people. It is. The scenes are acted out <laughs> as crazy as you can think. Yeah. Okay, well, let, let's leave that and uh, move on to our next movie, which is also from a few years ago. This is a 2007 movie, From Within. Directed by, and this is a nice name, Fadon Papa Michael, written by Brad Keane. It stars Elizabeth Rice as Lindsay, Thomas Decker, who people will recognize his name as Aiden, Kelly Blatz, great beer. Blatz. Blatz as, Blatz. as Dylan, Laura Allen as Trish, Adam Goldberg as Roy, and uh, Rumor Willis as Natalie. Rumor Willis being. Daughter of uh, Demi and Bruce, I believe. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, it's a funny name, rumor. This is a complete rip-off of The Hidden, <laughs> except for with no humor in it whatsoever. Right, right, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it, it's more supernatural. The Hidden is... Without is the alien. Pure sci-fi. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, this is about a bunch of kids, and they're killing themselves, right? Yeah, it starts off with the, <coughs> this couple, these... A girl and a guy in a field, basically. And this guy is reciting some enchantments from a book. Right. And then he shoots himself in the head. Right, right, right. And kills himself. Right. Commits suicide. And then things go from there. It seems like anybody who looked or was in the vicinity of the person that killed themselves would suddenly get possessed. Right. And they would be drawn to kill themselves as as well. well. And it's this is a small town in Maryland. This is uh, the Thomas Decker character's older brother. Yeah. Who killed himself. The yeah. first first one to kill. And he's with his girlfriend or whatever. Yeah, I guess he's his girlfriend. And she No, well, he's too weird. The Thomas Decker character doesn't have a girlfriend. He knows the No, main no, no, girl. his brother. Oh, yeah, yeah. At the beginning yeah, yeah. is with his girlfriend. Yeah. And she ends up going home and they have to go to the funeral for the brother and all this stuff. And of course, his brother Thomas Decker is his name? Yeah, Decker. He's wondering what happened to his brother as mm-hmm. well. So the possession goes from person to person to person and through this family, right. the girl ends up committing suicide, then her sister, then her dad or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember the whole sequence. Yeah. But everybody's committing suicide. Yeah, it's a busy family. And it's like within days of one another. You know, yeah. it's like this is an a very, epidemic. But it seems that only one person is possessed at a time. And there's some nice special effects. They wind up sort of, they see themselves in a mirror and the mirror image is like hideous and urging them to, you know, here's a way to kill it's, yourself. It's a mirror image of themselves in yeah. an ugly form. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're, they're sort of killing themselves off. Yeah, they're, that's they're right. Helping that's them right. kill themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like one they of the, believe what they see in the mirror, and they might as well die because it's too horrible. And when to they live. start, yeah, and yeah. the main girl in the in the movie, she figures out what is going on, mm-hmm. and then they find out that this is a curse. Right, that, right. That, it was laid on by the older brother. Yeah, it started yeah. with the older brother. He performed the ritual, and then he killed himself. Right, but he's not expecting to stay it, dead. Yeah, well, no, he had a reason to do it. Yeah, he wanted yeah. to get a retribution to this small town. Yeah. But did, wasn't he expecting to come back? No. Oh, I thought there no. was there was a way he was going to be. Coming he wanted back. to, and I don't know why he wanted to, but he wanted to hurt the town. Yeah, it's explained. I don't remember exactly why. It's, Turns out <clears throat> that his brother and this girl figure out what's going on. Right. And so she gets infected, and she knows she's infected, and now they're trying to find the antidote kind of thing. How do we break the curse? Right. So they have to find a book and Mm -hmm. try to break the curse. I thought it was all right. It's it's like a good little teenage horror movie. It needed Um, more comedy. (laughs) Yeah, really. It's a little cleverer than, than the average slasher movie, but it's not that much cleverer. It's still basically... You're just, just killing yourself, though. Teen. You're not... It's not yeah, like but you're it, killing you know, someone else. Dead teens is a big draw at the box office. So. Yeah, and the <laughs> thing is that they didn't want to kill themselves. They were being terrorized yeah. by themselves. Yeah, well, or, or it's some demon or something. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever it is. I found it entertaining. I, mean, mm-hmm. I said it was like a rip-off of The, the Hidden, but right. it, it just... 
to the fact that the thing jumps from person to person yeah, to yeah, person. Yeah. And it, I mean, completely different circumstances. Yeah. And so, in, in other words, it's not much like the hidden at all. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, I didn't think so. <laughs> yeah, the hidden. Yeah, other than the fact that the hidden is a space alien crawling from, from body person, to body and yeah. ruining each body as it goes and killing other people. Well, they're getting killed because the police are hunting them. Yeah. But there's only one guy, Kyle McLaughlin, who understands that he's actually hunting an alien. People well, that's just because he's an alien. Bodies. Yeah, and he's an alien, too. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, get on to the last movie of this show, and uh, we saved a goodie till the end. I quite like this one. It's a movie from 2012 called Hello, Herman, directed by Michelle Danner, written by John Buffalo Mailer. He's um, half Buffalo. Uh, <laughs> stars Norman Reedus, our, uh, our good pal Daryl from The Walking Dead. Garrett Backstrom as the uh, titular character, Herman Howards. Martha Higarido as Isa Cruz and Rob Estes as Chet Clarkson. The two main characters are Norman Reedus as Lax and Garrett Backstrom as Herman. And Herman, one day, he's a high school student, kind of a unlikable He's not unlikable, but he has no friends. He's he's kind of a, a jerk. loner. He's alone. He's a sad case. And one day he prepares himself and he comes to school and he locks the gymnasium and he kills something like thirty eight students and three teachers or grown ups, whatever. Yeah. So he kills forty one people and before he turns himself into the police, he sends a message an uh, email e- electronically to Lax, to the Norman Reedus character, who is a controversial radio, internet sort of news blogger. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, you know, Lax, you're the only person I want to talk to. I want you to tell my story. I want to get it out there. So the kid, even though he's only supposed to be 16 or 17 years old, he's the first kid who's given the death sentence. Not just the death sentence, but they're going to broadcast of course. the execution, which is good for ratings. I can see Fox yeah. broadcasting it. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Lax is in there, and he's doing video interviews with the kid, and the kid slowly, slowly starts to divulge all the reasons. And at the same time, the Norman Reedus character, Lax, we see a parallel story in which he did something despicable, which was he was infiltrating white supremacists, American Nazis, right down to the fact that he had a a big swastika tattooed on his chest and stuff. And so he's pretending to be a member of the Aryan nation so that he can get in and help eliminate it to the police. But at the same time, he has to prove himself because there are suspicions among among some of his rivals in the in the Aryan gang. And to prove himself, he has to take a baseball bat to a poor little black kid. Mm -hmm. It just breaks your heart. And, of course, Norman's character is horrified at this. But he does. He takes a bat, and he hits the kid a couple of times, and then the rest of them take over, and the kid is killed. That's the end of the little black boy. So Norman is carrying this around. You're talking about Lax. Yeah, yeah, his character. Norman's character is carrying this guilt around with him the whole time. And the kid, Herman, is sort of comparing himself with what Lax did when he was younger. And, of course, it's not the same. And Lax is trying to explain this to him. And it isn't until, well, I really don't want to give this away, but it's all about growing up. It's about taking responsibility. And it's about being a reasonable human being. It's about bullying in in school, both by teachers and students. Yeah, yeah. It's about video game violence. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there was a lot of it in there. Yeah, but I mean, the, all kids play violent video games. So the fact that a few who commit mass murders, like at Columbine, were playing video games, they were also bowling. You know, so you might as well say well, no, no, that but bowling in this, causes in this particular that. instance, they're showing him play a game mm-hmm. where the object is to kill as many people as you can. Yeah, but that's that's like I say, how many kids play those games and don't go on mass? I'm killing just saying spree. that that's part of this movie. They were bringing up those issues. Okay, but what I'm saying is that it's a boondoggle. It doesn't mean anything. This guy 
had slipped when the it, cog and he would have killed those kids. Well, Lax asked him point blank, do you yeah. think video yeah. games gave you the ability to go off and kill people right. without any emotional attachment? Yeah, yeah. And he yeah. says yes, yes, right off the bat. What, what's his name? The maniac who used to put the cast on his arm and lure Dahmer? Him. No, um, no, the one who was in Seattle for a while down in Washington State just across the border. Anyway, he was, he was executed and uh, he was blaming pornography. But, uh, you know, because he wanted to stir up a ruckus and hopefully keep himself from being executed. No. Oh. You know, well, I, anyway, other things that they were dealing in with in this movie were, you know, relationships with your family. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Family, rela- yeah. which I really felt sorry for his mom and yeah. not. It's an interesting way that they portrayed her. Mm-hmm. You know, at some point I was mad at her. Right. And right. other points I sympathized She's with her. She's a victim, her. too. She's yeah. a victim and yeah. she yeah. and yet. You could see she that never had any time for him. Yeah, because she says she was working all the time and she trying had to provide to work. for him. So you know? you know, society has to take some of the blame too because she's a single mom and she couldn't be there for. And her, so. also, peer pressure brought was yep. come in yep. because there yeah. were people that liked him, right. but were too afraid to show that they right. liked him right. 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 because of everybody girl. else. Yeah, and they were yeah. because of the bullies. Yeah. The media hype, there was a lot of fake news coverage and and debate Mm -hmm. with the uh, GOP point of view and the liberal point of view. A lot of that happening. Yeah, Yeah. there's a blocking of Fox and other news. And also how social media plays Mm -hmm. part of of all their lives and things like that that cause cyberbullying and all this stuff as well. So there's lots going on in this. Did did you ever see the movie Elephant? Elephant made by uh, Gus Van Zandt. It was out a few years ago. I know I talked about it on this show years ago. It is about a pair of loners, uh, high school kids, who are essentially doing the Columbine murder. Mm-hmm. They show them playing a murdering video game. And the game that they're playing, and I thought this was a beautiful, clever way to do it. They show the game that they're playing, and it's not a game. It's simply a field. And these sort of, they're not human Really, but these figures appear and you shoot it. And then another one appears and you shoot it. And they're all exactly the same. And like I say, they're not really human. They're just sort of these figures that sort of blop up, bloop, bloop, bloop. And you just kill them. There's no object to the game. There's no ending to the game. It's just the same kill, kill, kill over and over. And essentially, you know, I mean, I used to play a lot of video games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, that's pretty close to, to the main point. <laughs> the story is what you add on after you've got the killing part of the game done. Right. You know, that's the important thing, One of which the things, is sad because yeah. there's no imagination in that. One of the things I thought was interesting. This would make a good double bill with Elephant is my uh, point. Ah. Uh, yeah. They go through all these different things to think about. What they don't go into is gun control at all. No. That no. is not even discussed. Yeah. They ask him how he got the weapon. That's as far as it goes. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought that was interesting, that they really didn't harp on that at all. Well, it's a given. If you want a gun in the U.S., it uh, obviously isn't that difficult to get a gun. No. So where it comes from is hardly the question. The fact that you can get guns that easily, that's the much bigger question. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, no, this isn't a movie that's tackling that subject. Not at all. Which would have alienated a lot of the audience. By not carping on that, I think they leave the way open so that people on both sides of that issue and people in the middle as well can watch this movie because it isn't specifically attacking one belief. You know, unless you're a white supremacist, you know, it's definitely anti-white supremacist. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I don't think they care if they lose that mark. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's interesting the way they shot it, Mm -hmm. the whole gym sequence. Mm -hmm. They never see anyone get shot. Because he's filming it. He's wearing a camera and he's filming his murders as it goes along. And the way they show it in the movie is that every time they talk about one of his victims. Right. And he'll go a little bit into the background yeah, yeah. why he did what well, he it goes, did. It goes right up to the gun being pointed at yeah. them and him pulling the trigger and it freezes at that moment or it cuts away at that moment that yeah. they die. Yeah, you never see... You never, you never see somebody's head being blown off, but he is blowing off a lot of heads. Yeah. So, which I thought was really interesting. Style. It was well done. It was yeah, well done. It didn't. Well. It didn't. It doesn't have to be bloody graphic, but it still. It, it was visceral. You still felt as if you saw all those murders. So I, I came away from this movie thinking they've opened up a lot of discussion. There's mm-hmm. a lot of dialogue that needs mm-hmm. to happen here. It's not 
one thing that contributed for him right, doing right. that. It was a series of events, yeah. and there was a strategy behind his madness right. going into that gym. Yeah, yeah. And I kept flip-flopping. Right. You know, I'd feel sorry for him because in certain instances, and then not sorry for him other things. Yeah, I'm yeah. going, did you learn anything? Yeah. Are you sympathetic to the people that you did sorry kill? Sorry you killed him, uh, yeah. yeah. Is there any regret there at all to the end? They handled the ending quite yeah. tastefully oh, as I th- well. I think the whole movie is very well done. Another movie that this reminded me of, um, geez, now it's just gone out of my head. It'll, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, another recent movie with, um, I, what's it, not Kate Blanchett, the other very cold, austere-looking English <laughs> actress. We've got to talk about Kevin. Yes, I never saw that. Oh, boy, that's also, you know, Elephant, we've got to talk about Kevin and Hello, Herman. Silly titles yeah. on all three of them. They don't give you any sort of a clue what the content of the movie is. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to talk about Kevin makes it sound like there's something about Mary. Yeah. It sounds like a goofy comedy. Yeah. But they're, all three of them, deadly, deadly serious movies about teen boys losing it. And not losing it and, and shooting people, but planning, yeah. deliberately planning to hurt as many people as they can. Yeah. I thought that in this one... His plan was to get back mostly at the people that did him wrong. Oh, yeah, They were yeah, mistreating yeah, him. No, he's rather Because he was calling people up. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't just going around yeah, shooting. absolutely. Yeah, he had yeah. a lot a lot of kids he hated. Yeah. <laughs> so, he, and what do you think of Norman Reedus? I mean, everybody who's a fan of uh, Walking Dead uh, loves Norman Reedus these yeah. days. What do you think of him in this? This movie was a very low-key movie. Yeah, it wasn't... It, it, and it shot... I don't know, in a way that almost looked like video, low budget. It's a low budget movie. It was a $1. Mm-hmm. $1.5 million right. dollars to make. Right, it. right. Well, Norman is shooting the kid with a little video camera. And the kid is shooting with like a body cam. So a lot of the movie is deliberately lo-fi. You know, very, very, very low tech. I thought when it's just a movie shot, like the two shot of them in, in the prison, and he's interviewing the kid, that was professionally done. It's unremarkable, because it's just a big sterile yeah, empty yeah, room, yeah. but that was professionally it, done. Yeah, I mean, just the colors they chose and everything, yeah. it's, it's very low-key, it's very, it's very gray. Yeah. It's not a fun movie, it's no. a, it's more of a, a really thoughtful. thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very thinking movie, so... Yeah. Not a feel-good movie at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> Most of these horror movies we watch are not feel-good movies. Oh, come on. Some of them there are pretty funny. <laughs> okay, let's go through them quickly. Ender's Game, would you recommend it or not? I liked it. Okay, Mark liked it more than I did. I thought the kid was very annoying. The Monkey's Paw, we both liked it. I think so. Yeah, yeah. low budget, you know, sort of a hoot. Not great by any means, but... Uh, no, just but, how things could go terribly oh, wrong. Terribly wrong. <laughs> Somebody gives you a monkey's paw, you know, throw it away. <laughs> I, but I like the way the Simpsons did that, yeah. where the, with the last wish in the, his, his sandwich. Yeah. He's going, yeah, and I don't want the sandwich yeah. to be a zombie yeah. sandwich, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want the sandwich to eat me. <laughs> yes. And then when he bites into it, he says... No, mayo! Yeah. No! <laughs> <laughs> it's bland. Um, possession. Would you recommend it? It's for the real hardcore insanity kind of... Fans? Fans. <laughs> oh, I, I, it, would, it would be a movie that I would have never watched unless I had to. Right. But right. at the same time... Well, did you want to stop watching it once you started? Uh, yeah. Did you? Oh, I, I quite enjoyed I kept, it. I kept... Going, what the hell? What yeah. the hell? Oh, what the hell? To me, that's great. It's like a film nightmare. It's just, it has it the is, logic or is, illogic of it, a nightmare. Very draining movie. Very, yeah. very draining. Yes. Drained right into the monster in the bedroom. Oh. From Within, the uh, movie with Thomas Decker. And Thomas Decker, of course. I know him from playing uh, John, uh, what's his name, in uh, Terminator, the TV series. The Sarah oh. Connor. Uh, John, John Connor. Connor. <laughs> that's it. Sarah Connor Chronicles, which, which is a TV series that I I thought it was well done. I I enjoyed the movie. Okay. Yeah, I I wouldn't go out of my way to to see it. I said, you know, a lot of these movies, when we say, yeah, they're okay to watch, that means I certainly would never watch it a second time. (laughs) Um, Hello, Herman, as Mark says, it's pretty darn depressing. It takes itself very seriously and rightfully so. I think it brings up really good points. Yeah, yeah. Because nothing is as cut and dry as the media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the media would have us believe that there's two sides to 
every argument, at least in the United States. There's only two sides to every argument. Yeah, and that, the left is, and the right. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is that with this movie, you see a whole bunch of yeah. issues. Yeah, life and death uh, is all, not black and white. All the relationships in his life. Is the guy a monster? <laughs> Yes, for doing the act, but at the same time, I can sympathize. He's with still him. a pathetic he, boy. There's some, yeah, yeah, he's. Yes. I feel real sympathy Confused for what he unloved. had to go and, through yeah, because yeah. life wasn't fair for him. No, no, that's right. So you would recommend it? Yeah, for just for the fact that it's a thinking movie. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Me, it's not me, one me for too. fun. No, no, no. It's a uh, so triple bill elephant. Uh, Let's talk about Kevin and yeah, that's right. We've got to talk about Kevin. Okay, all right, folks. So uh, we're gonna say so long. That's episode one thirty in the bag. And welcome to 2014. That's right. That's right. And more shows coming up this is, is year. Is the folks. end of the world supposed to happen anytime soon again? No, no. We we dodged that bullet on uh, 122112. Uh, I saw a movie the other day entitled 131313. Yes, I saw. We talked about that on, did, on the show. Yeah. Did some we actually time back. talk about that? Yes. Because I did. didn't. I didn't watch it. Oh, you might not have seen it, but I know I talked about it. I, I saw it. Which I thought was what a stupid title. Where did they get the 13th month from? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not very well done either, as I recall. Okay, 